Hi everyone, welcome back to Natural Beauty Summit's Love and Babies, a Health Journey. I'm your host, Salome Salehi, founder of Sugar Sugar Wax, and this is my co-host, Angela Chan, founder of M-Beauty. Today's conversation is all about chemicals, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Angela, will you tell us a little bit about Ida Garcia Toledo? Absolutely. So. in investigative journalism, she now channels her talents to researching the impact of toxic chemicals on our health. She is passionate about educating parents on the hazards of daily exposure to toxic chemicals and helping them transition to a healthier and less chemically dependent lifestyle. And one of the things that I love about what Ida does is she'll actually go into clients' homes and do an assessment on some of the elusive toxins that might be lurking. Stay tuned for my conversation with Ida Garcia Toledo. Hey guys, welcome to Natural Beauty Summit's Love and Babies, a Health Journey series. Today I am here with Aida Garcia Toledo, who is the founder of Three Little Plums, as well as an environmental consultant. And we are gonna be digging into some major, major environmental things that you guys are gonna love. I thought I knew a lot, but I've learned a lot more through Aida. So um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, love what you guys are doing. So excited to be here. Thank you for being here. I love what you're doing. And I kind of want to get right into it and dig right into PFAS or PFASs because during our last summit, I actually um, learned a lot more about them from uh, the founder of EWG, Ken Cook. And I literally like tossed all my nonstick cookware. I swore off Gore-Tex and, you know, I made all of these changes, but now I'm, all these studies are coming out sharing that like PFASs are being found in the most unexpected places, like in fish, um, period underwear that came some while, like a while ago. It's now leaching into condiments like ketchup and mustard. And the one that really threw me off, which I actually um, learned about through you is um, the compostable plates. Yes, yes, What? Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, what is the new rule book? And like, maybe just kind of step back a little bit and for yeah. our audience who isn't familiar with PFAS, yeah. Um, can, can you share a little bit about this demon forever chemical? Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, I love talking about PFAS and I've been talking about it for more than a decade because it's, um, it's a class of chemicals. You know, there's more than 6,000. I think at last count there's 7,000, 8,000. Like we don't really know how many of them there are, but there are many, it's like a family, a big family of chemicals and they are all fluorine based and they have, you know, at a molecular level, they have carbon. And what makes them so useful in a way is that they are the chemicals that make things either stain resistant or water resistant or grease proof. So like you mentioned, you know, all almost all the items that you mentioned, um, they're being used for one of those um, traits, right? So on the nonstick cookware, which is where we first started hearing about PFAS chemicals, and it was like the Teflon chemicals. Those are just some of the chemicals. And um, those start, those were the first ones we heard about, and it was because it's nonstick and they work so well. And then those kind of started, we, we went from these long chain ones to shorter chain ones, which people thought were safer. And then we started seeing them popping up in all kinds of items, like you mentioned, from compostable um, plates and bowls to period underwear to food. And the question is, A, why is it everywhere? Mm -hmm. um, and how can we avoid these chemicals? So the answer is, 
we can't really avoid them at this point. They are truly in every, you know, they're just everywhere, but we can do a lot to reduce our exposure to them, you know, and I look around my house and I'm like, I feel like I do a really good job of, because I've been doing this for so long, I know exactly how to identify them and where they're found. But even I am not avoiding it. I can't live in a bubble, right? So, um, but what, going back a little bit to answering your question, you know, why are they in food, in the food supply? Well, it's probably thought that it's not that they're putting PFAS into the condiments, like the ketchup, you know, the company's not doing this on purpose, but the machinery probably contains some sort of non-toxic aspect. And that's how it's leaching into the supply chain. That's what is the thought. They still don't know. They still have to test this, these, you know, things out. But that's what we think is happening. Um, fish contains PFAS because sadly, a lot of um, fresh water, um, like rivers and streams, that's already contaminated with PFAS chemicals. And when the fish is, you know, there, living there, they're becoming contaminated. Today, actually, EWG, which you just mentioned, um, sent out an email, which was fascinating, talking about 100 plus animals that are now contaminated with PFAS chemicals. And we're talking about like animals that live in the North Pole and the Arctic and the Antarctic in, in, in very, you know, in places where there is no industrialized life or, you know, it's not a city animal and yet they are contaminated. They have PFAS in their bodies and their systems. Babies are born pre um, polluted with PFAS chemicals. So it's, it's really, you know, the lesson is, and oh, and the other thing that's important to mention is that the one thing that is most worrisome about these chemicals is that they don't, so there's some chemicals that you'll have it in your body. And then within a couple of days, a couple of hours, you excrete it. So the idea being, if you stop your exposure to that chemical, your levels will go down. But PFAS chemicals tend to accumulate and they can last for many years. Some PFAS chemicals will last for 20 years inside your body. Um, so say you were exposed to that, you were using that nonstick cooking, um, you know, 10 years ago and you stopped using it, but it's still in your body. And then you're exposed to this other PFAS. So it's the amount of PFAS in your body kind of accumulates and grows, right? So that's why it becomes really important to cut it out of your life if you can, where you can. And, um, you know, luckily nowadays we know a lot more. So we know where to make these cuts. And, um, and you know, one of the great things is that we know that when things are certified organic in terms of clothing or period underwear or period um, products also, those won't contain PFAS. Um, but beyond that, it is hard. It is hard. So you kind of have to be like a detective. You have to look for buzzwords. If something says performance fabric, if something says for upholstery, if something says Gore-Tex or waterproof, for clothing um, or upholstery. If something says grease proof, you know, you have to be like, oh, that's a word that could be related to PFAS. So I am going to either write the company and ask specifically, does your product contain PFAS? Or kind of look, you know, look it up in the website. My experience is that most companies that produce nowadays products that do not contain PFAS, they are proud of it and they like write it and they include it in their description. So it's usually not that hard. When you don't read anything about PFAS free, then you have to kind of wonder um, and either ask or move on to the next product. Does that and explain? Look, yeah. And like um, the PFAS, uh, like when you have like Scotch Guard, where they say, oh, like put Scotch Guard on your sofas. That's a yes. bad idea, right? That's a horrible idea. That is because the problem is that the PFAS um, in that case, in that product that you're spraying on, it doesn't just stick to the couch. It will migrate away from the couch into your dust. And then you're breathing it in your house and you're breathing it in while you're in your house or in the office or at schools. Um, so, so yes, definitely avoid the Scotch guard. And then, you know, I think a lot of people are kind of scared to buy, especially if you have kids or if you have pets, they're afraid to buy furniture. That's not performance fabric because yeah. they, you know, they think, well, 
it's going to get stained. And yes, it could get stained. But, um, you know, we've had we've had three kids. We have three kids um, and we've had stains in our in our sofas. But we do have we wash them. And generally, most stains come off. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> So there's ways around it. Um, and it's always just generally a good idea to clean your furniture. Yes. Not only because of the PFAS, but yes, there's many other reasons. Um, yeah. That's a good habit to have for upholstered furniture in general. Yes. Okay. So um, I want to kind of uh, go through like different parts of our home where toxins might be lurking that we haven't actually talked about in the summits ever. Um, so I want to kind of go to the closet and that's one area that like, it really honestly wasn't even much on my radar other than the PFAS association with Gore-Tex. Um, like how is formaldehyde lurking in our closets? Can you please yeah. just explain how that even happens? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to jump in here and say that I agree with you. It's, it wasn't the first thing on my radar either. Right. Um, like I said, I've been doing low tox living for over 13 years and that was not one of the first things on my radar, but what I started learning through the years is that there's a lot of toxins in our clothes. And, um, you know, nowadays I understand the value of, um, certain certifications in clothing. Um, so going back to formaldehyde, formaldehyde is one chemical that is very, very often used in um, mostly in shirts, but in clothing that doesn't require like iron free shirts, oh, for example, God. wrinkle free. Um, yes. Anytime you see something wrinkle free, iron free, that has formaldehyde because that's the chemical that's used to avoid the wrinkles. Um, and it's not only clothing, it's also very often used in bed sheets um, that you see nowadays. So you could have something um, that you're going to be sleeping on that is wrinkle free, no iron necessary, but it has formaldehyde and you're going to be breathing it, um, you know, at a very close range. And I will also mention that our skin is an organ and, um, it absorbs everything that's on it. So it's definitely, you know, something to avoid. Um, I avoid wrinkle free, you know, no iron clothing. Um, Often it's also used just in new clothing in general to a lesser degree um, for, you know, when you buy something in a store, it just looks very um, just ironed and very, and then you bring it home and you wash it and it looks not that great. Um, that's probably because some formaldehyde was used there, some sort of a chemical with formaldehyde or a finish. Um, so a little bit of the formaldehyde will wash off, but if you think about it, if you buy a no iron shirt, it remains no iron or iron free or whatever um, for many, you know, uses and years. So that means that the chemical is still there. It'll come off slowly, but it's still there. Um, wow. So that's just one chemical, though. I mean, there's chemicals, there's chem there's phthalates, which are um, traditionally known endocrine disrupting chemicals that can be used that are usually used like in plastics to make plastic soft. And they're also used in fragrances but they're also found in clothing. Um, you know, the most obvious place where they're found is like in children's clothing. If you have a t-shirt with like a, a hologram kind of thing or a lamination, um, that usually will contain violets, um, which are sadly very popular because kids love wearing t-shirts with their favorite, I don't know, Disney character or whatever, yeah. right? So you have to be careful with that, that type of clothing. You really, really do. Okay, let's go into the kitchen. Um, cause you know, I find the kitchen, it, it, especially if you cook at home, it's challenging because there's always like some new gadget, some new technology, like remember when silicon mats came out and it was like a whole thing. And actually last summer I was visiting with some family and, um, uh, my uncle was using a barbecue silicon mat where you grill on this plastic like thing interesting it was completely bananas to me so um can you can we get into the kitchen a little bit and i'd love for you to talk about like cookware utensils um yeah. i know it's a lot to cover like tupperware aluminum <laughs> plastic wrap all the things um 
if you can just kind of give us do's and don'ts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the kitchen is, it's actually a great place to start because I think, you know, we spend so much time in the kitchen, we're cooking there. Um, and there's a lot of things. So let's, you, and you can guide me if I get on a tangent because I tend to. No, no, <laughs> please do. Yeah. Hours on the kitchen. But, um, you know, if we're talking about silicone. We'll start there, right? Silicone can be used safely. So let's start. There's quality silicone there's different silicone different quality right generally you want to look for medical grade silicone or platinum grade silicone these are the better quality silicones um anything that doesn't have that title you want to avoid because silicone can contain heavy metals like lead especially when it's colorful um an easy test i wish i had something here with silicone but if you have an item that's silicone and you kind of pinch it if you see that it looks like a, something that's colorful, kind of white, usually that means that it's of lesser quality and it could contain fillers and you would kind of avoid that because it could contain lead and different fillers in the color. Um, silicone can be used safely. It's relatively inert. However, it should not be exposed to heat. Um, after about, I've heard different numbers, but I've seen studies that show that anything over when it's exposed to over 350-ish degrees Fahrenheit, um, siloxanes, which are endocrine disrupting compounds, can leach, can come out of silicone. So if you are constantly baking with silicone molds and you're baking at a higher temperature, anything over 350-ish, um, those siloxanes are going to migrate into the food and you're going to ingest it. Same with like the silicone mats. So um, generally I recommend for baking, you have glass, cast iron, and stainless steel. Those are your three. You want to avoid silicone for baking and you want to avoid aluminum, which is often used too because it's cheaper than stainless steel. Okay, um, we got to talk about aluminum for a second because... Sure. Um, some years ago, I got rid of all of my like, like nonstick coated baking sheets. Yeah. And I switched them out for the hardcore like aluminum baking sheets that like the bakers use thinking, oh, I'm doing such a great job. And then I saw your content. And I was like, what? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say I think aluminum would be a little bit better than the non-toxic coating one, coated ones. So there's that. But aluminum is a neurotoxin. So if you're, if this is something, again, it's all about balance in that you have to kind of look at what you use at your, in your house, in your routine. If you're using, if you have an aluminum cookie sheet and you use it twice a year, it's okay. Put a little parchment paper, chlorine-free parchment paper. I like if you care. And that's fine. But if it's something you're using daily or weekly to roast vegetables, to bake, et cetera, then it's really worth investing in something like one that's made out of stainless steel, which would be my recommendation. Where do you it's even get that? I've never even seen a stainless steel pan. They're harder to find. I have a couple of my Amazon shop. Um, okay, good. Has, has one that is expensive. But again, if you're using it constantly, yeah. it'll last you for. 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 20 years, Alcon is actually very good quality and um, you'll definitely get the use out of it. So I would totally recommend that. Um, I do think it's worth it if you're using it a lot. You should never also bake with aluminum foil. I know that a lot of people do that. They will, um, you know, kind of use it to cover something and it's not ideal. It would be preferable to use a parchment paper but again, you want to use the chlorine-free parchment paper um, instead of stainless steel or something else. Okay, um, so aluminum foil, like, again, we're talking about climbing the steps of, like, yeah. toxicity here. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to use any more saran wrap because that is all phthalates and microplastics and God knows what else. It's plastic that's, sure. like, easily leaching into whatever you put it on. Um, so then I'm like, okay, if I need to cover food, I will either use aluminum foil or I will use, um, like, uh, like a silicon, a silicon bag or something. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you're using the aluminum foil, 
to store something in the refrigerator to kind of cover up Tupperware, for example, that's fine because A, it's not necessarily having direct contact with the food and it's still cold. So there's not as much leaching going on. He usually increases leaching. So that's still under you know, approved, okay to do. Um, I certainly have, I don't tend to use aluminum foil, but I have some in my kitchen. So if ever, you know, if it's like Thanksgiving and I just have a lot of leftovers, I'll use that. And that's fine to cover a Tupperware or something. Um, a I glass don't recommend Tupperware. cooking with it. Yeah. But I mean, well, I would say I don't recommend cooking with aluminum foil, but again, if you do this once or twice a year, it's okay. It's, it's not a huge amount of anything coming into your, your clothes, your food. Um, it's just, again, when you're using these things constantly, that these little amounts will add up. Okay. Um, yeah. So, and in terms of Tupperware, this is like, for me, it's one of the easiest changes and it's not even that expensive. You should not, you need to stop using plastic Tupperware. Um, plastic Tupperware, when exposed to heat, will um, give off different plasticizers, including the thylates that we mentioned earlier. Sometimes it could contain BPA. Um, so you just want to avoid that. It's unnecessary. It's bad for the environment. They don't last that long. Um, better option is glass containers. Just buy a bunch of them in different sizes. Um, people often ask me, well, is it okay if the cover is plastic? It's fine because you wouldn't reheat it with the plastic cover, but um, to store in the refrigerator, completely safe. It, it will be inert. So that's what I would recommend. And that's like a really easy switch. Okay, good, good. We like easy switches here. <laughs> now let's talk about, um, I want to talk about kids for a second because, you know, we get their, um, you know, they have their own like little utensils and they're all plastic. I mean, I know that there is a brand that does bamboo something, but I feel like even yeah. that's coated in something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. What, what do what you do <laughs> yeah, like cups, utensils, Everything. plate, um, okay. bowls, what do you give them? So I think that there's a misconception that is that children need to use plastic because everything else will break. Um, you really don't want to give kids plastic because again, same reason, plastic is not only bad for the environment, but it will contain different plasticizers that will migrate to clo to the food and the child will, you know, and they're going to be sucking on it, etc. So better materials are stainless steel. I mean, I personally love stainless steel um, plates and cups because if you have a child who likes to throw things, that will break, you know, they, they will last forever. Um, so that's my number one. You could use silicone. I have used silicone um, plates. I don't put it in the dishwasher in a high heat setting. I hand wash it instead, but I'm comfortable using silicone plates or cups, especially for like the youngest babies um, who start using that. And um, those are my two main go-tos. I used to use with my older two kids when there wasn't, my oldest one is 13. So there wasn't as many products as there are nowadays. And so back then I would use um, glass plates, but they would come covered in like a silicone cover. That's great because glass is ultimately the best um, material that you want to use. Um, so those are my three go-tos. I, I get asked a lot about melamine. Melamine, you don't want to use. I don't recommend it because, um, again, when exposed to heat, it can leach compounds that aren't great for our health. Um, I don't love bamboo because bamboo often requires an adhesive yes. um, that contains formaldehyde So or melamine, melamine, which has the other. So I, the bet your best bet really is stainless steel, um, some silicone and glass. Um, I noticed that you were talking about kitchen utensils in um one of your clips, and um, and I think it just like really simplified the kitchen for me so much. Like wood, stainless steel. You were saying use those for like your cooking utensils or whatever. And I was like, oh my gosh, like since I've gotten rid of all my nonstick stuff, then I don't need plastic utensils because I could use stainless steel in a cast iron pan. I can use, you know, like you stainless steel, you really can't use it anywhere other than like stainless steel pans, cast iron and glass. Right, right. And it just simplified the whole kitchen for me. It's like, oh my gosh. 
Like just make everything like glass, stainless steel, cast iron. Those are the three go-to. You can use them at Liberty and you know that you will be in good hands. Um, yeah, I think that we just have to just um, stay away from the plastic and the nonstick. I think those are the two things. And if you can remember that sometimes it just seems overwhelming because you look around and you're like, oh my gosh, where do I start? But, you know, just do it one thing at a time, one thing at a time, one thing at a time. And that will add up. Absolutely. Um, and it makes a huge difference. It does. And we haven't spoken that much about cast iron, but that's like my number one um, material to use in the kitchen. But even, and I, you know, I, I use it for bakeware and I use it for um, pots and, you know, pans. But even then, I would always recommend the bottom line, you know, for the kitchen is, use these three kinds of products, but diversify. And by that, I mean, don't just start using stainless steel and only use stainless steel. Incorporate the wood, incorporate the glass, incorporate the cast iron. Um, so it's actually four, um, you know, so that you're not just using one product. Why? Like, well, the reality is that stainless steel could give off a little bit of nickel, um, and cast iron could give off a little bit of iron, you know, or will give off a little bit of iron. So you just, you want to balance things. I think it's just, it's, for me, it's really, um, you know, it's a good idea to, to live in balance in everything. You know, when you're eating, you want to balance, you don't want to eat just, you know, carrots and sweet potatoes. They're really healthy, but you want to balance it because guess what? They can contain natural levels of heavy metals, right? Yeah. So they're good but in balance. <laughs> and I think that's just like a good mantra to have in life. Everything in balance, not everything, sure. but the good stuff in balance. I love that. And I love the diversity aspect of it. Like just diversify your exposure. It's like diversify your diet, diversify your exercise. It really applies to everything. Um, I want to talk about cast iron for a second, just because I've been having this conversation with my mom lately, <laughs> who grew up when Teflon became a thing. You know what I mean? So I'm like yeah. trying to convince her, but like, she's always complaining about the cast iron pen and she's convinced that it's constantly leaching iron into our food. And when yeah. she burns something and it's black, she's like, that's iron. We're eating, <laughs> you know? So is that like, how do you it's change that perception? Is that real? I mean, no, I think, I mean, it will leach a little bit of iron. There's no doubt about that, but it's a, the small amounts tend to be within, unless you have an issue with iron and you're, you know, or really high levels of iron, they're within this totally safe levels. And um, it's not like, we're not talking about like every little piece is, it's not like you're in ingesting huge amounts of iron. Um, I think that the main misconception is that it won't be non-tox, I mean, non-stick because sometimes there is a learning curve when you're using cast iron. Um, I always say it's, it's just give it a try. You know, you might make a couple of mistakes when you're cooking, for example, making eggs or, or um, pancakes, you know, which are always the two things that people ask me about. But it really can be nonstick. You just have to kind of learn how to use it and how to clean it or not to clean it and what to clean it with. But once you have it down, it's really a great, great alternative, much more efficient in cooking than a nonstick plan. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think that um, it's more of just using it and getting used to it. And, and you know, I remember I actually put off using cast iron for many years because I was intimidated. I was really intimidated by cast iron, which seems silly now, but I was intimidated by that. I was like, how do you wash that? You can't use yeah. soap. How, how does that, you know, even how does it clean? work? Tell us. Well, I mean, you, your, your, the idea of cast iron is that you want to build kind of like a coating, right? And that comes with like the grease from the food and this sounds gross, but this is how you build a nonstick coating. Anytime you clean a cast iron with soap, you're going to strip that coating off, which is fine. You could always recoat it, you know, put some oil on it and put it in the oven and it'll seal it again. But um, 
the ideal way of cleaning cast iron is you can use some salt and then like scrub it with like a little chain length thing that you buy. Um, or you can, that's when it's like really grimy. And if not, you could just literally get a paper towel or a piece of cloth and kind of just like smooth it out. And that's it usually. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a shift, I guess, yeah. you know, it's a shift in the way of thinking of pots and pans and of cleaning and of materials that are safe. But again, and I say this to everyone, my husband is the one in charge of breakfast at our house and he uses, he loves the cast iron and he, and he also uses stainless steel to make eggs, to make, you know, pancakes. So if he can do it, if he can learn, we can all learn. <laughs> I mean, it's doable and it's just such a better material just from a toxicity standpoint, so much better than using um, nonstick. I mean, there's just no way around the nonstick coating. It's bad. It's horrible. Um, what yeah. about the enameled cast iron? Is that, is the enamel like similar to the nonstick coating in any way? Is that something we should be worried about? So it's not similar um, in, in it, that it doesn't contain PFAS chemicals. That's the good news. Um, it often does contain heavy metals. It could contain lead. It could contain cadmium. Um, so you want to be careful with enameled cast iron, even Le Crusette has been found to contain cadmium on their enameled cast iron, low levels, legal levels, but they're there. Yeah. So what I recommend is don't use your, if you have an enameled cast iron, you know, if you have a cocotte or something like that, don't use it daily. Um, if, if it's something you're using daily, then you should transition away and maybe just use a normal cast iron, you know, do that. But if it's something again that you use five times a year for, you know, like if you do stews, if you, you like to make a stew and that's why you're using it for, then it's perfectly okay. Um, but you just, if it's something you're using often, you want to really stick to the normal cast iron, the uncoated, you know, and, um, or the stainless steel or the glass or the wood. Those are your options. That is great to know because I literally have been loving cast iron so much that I was about to expand my enameled cast iron collection. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad yeah. I learned this before I did. And, um, and it's so expensive too. It is. So it is. They, and and they'll the last forever. I mean, they're really good. But, um, but yeah, if you're going to choose one, the better one toxicity wise would be the, like the cast iron, not the enameled. Gotcha. Okay. I want to get into bedding because you kind of touched on it earlier and I don't think bedding gets a lot of airtime. And one of the things that I have noticed in the last five years, cause I'm like really big on like good sheets. Yeah. I find it harder and harder to find cotton sheets. There's hmm. this oleotech, wrinkle-free, like, you know, a million thread count. I'm exaggerating a million, but you know what I mean? Like all these ridiculous claims. And, you know, sometimes we'll be like seeing at an Airbnb and I'm like, this is, it feels like plastic. Yeah. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. I mean, for me, I think... And again, it's the same thing with clothing. Um, at this point in my life, I feel that you want to stick to natural fibers. Let's start there, right? Um, at a minimum, you want to go with like cotton, for example, right? Without just plain cotton. Now, the ideal situation is a GOTS certified, G-O-T-S certified organic cotton that will assure you that you're sleeping on something that has no pesticide residue, has no dyes with any kind of heavy metals or anything, um, it's, and, and no formaldehyde and all of that. So that's really your ideal. I think that, I mean, the reality is that not everyone can afford got certified organic cotton and that's a, a reality. And then if that's you, just stick with cotton, but don't look for any, you know, look for something that's not ideally Ocotex. For example, I know that like Target sells cotton sheets that are Ocotex certified. That's another certification and it's very good um, and trustworthy. So that's a second, you know, second tier kind of thing. You know, you want to, tier number one, ideal option is got certification, which is organic. Tier number two, second best option is Ocotex. Um, and what's really exciting and amazing is that nowadays 
you know, 2023, for the last three or four or five years, we can find much more of these products. Like I'm just blown away if I consider, if I, when I think back to 13 years ago, 10 years ago, when I started this and today, I, I mean, we're really lucky. There's a lot of options at different price points. Um, but before it was like ridiculously expensive to find GOT certified organic cotton. Yeah, sheets, I've sheets, never even know. heard of GOT certified organic cotton. So GOT certification is, is the go-to certification that you can trust. If you read something that says made with organic cotton, you know, just without the GOT certification, that can mean that that product legally can contain, I think, as low as like 9% organic cotton and the rest could be non-organic. Wow. It could also contain 95% organic, but there's no law, right, telling you when it says made with organic cotton, you don't really know how much organic cotton is being used. So GOT certification confirms that A, it's all organic cotton, right? B, it also talks about like labor and it makes sure that there are like fair labor issues and um, wages and all that. So it looks into that part too, that aspect of it. And it also looks at the whole process from pretty much from like the cotton, organic cotton crop to the time that you bring it home. So everything from like the dyes, um, any detergent that's used on the fabric, um, even like the tags have to all meet certain requirements. So wow. it's really the best, the premier, the one that you could really trust. Um, standard for it's sure. not perfect, but it's as close to perfect as we have right now. That is awesome. Okay, let's talk about cleaning products because I think <laughs> cleaning is one of those areas that like actually the pretty toxic chemicals are right in front of us. They're not hiding, they're not lurking, but we use them anyway. Yeah, and yeah. One of the things that like, I just have such a hard time convincing my husband with is like, I literally have to explain to him every time that the steam mop gets all the bacteria and it gets yeah. everything clean as much as like a chemical concoction cleaning right. agent would. Yeah. So like, why is the struggle like it's so hard to change this way of thinking or behaving. Well, I what think that um, it, it's a real struggle. And it, I think it's for the reality is that for years, for, you know, for years, especially for people maybe our age or let's say 30 and up, you know, the companies, the cleaning companies have done an amazing job to convince us and our parents and our grandparents that clean means smells like pine, smells like lemon, smells, right? So, so many people associate cleaning or something that's clean with something that smells clean because of the product that they're using, right? And if it doesn't smell clean, it can't be clean. So what, what the companies that are doing this are the ones like the Pine Sol, the Lysol, the Clorox bleach, and you know, I've, I've had multiple conversations with clients that they're like, but it's not clean if it doesn't smell like bleach. <laughs> you know, did you really oh clean God. it? Did you really disinfect it? I'm like, yes. So um, I think that's, you know, that's something that you kind of have to realize um, consciously, like, and realize, well, there's a marketing department or many marketing departments that for a generation or two worked really hard to kind of just convince us that these products, these chemicals clean and these don't. Now, the reality is that by law, um, companies that produce cleaners, they do not have to disclose ingredients, right? Um, they can, we know that a lot of these products do contain harmful chemicals um, that are harmful for our health, they're harmful for the environment. Um, we know that if you clean with these products, it's not only the person that's cleaning, who's getting affected or, um, but it's also that remains on that surface. So if you're cleaning floor with X product, um, that remains there for a while. So if you have a child that is crawling there, or if, you, if it's your office and it's enclosed and you work in that office where they just cleaned those fumes, that smell that you're smelling, you're getting exposed to those chemicals. And again, this is something that you're doing day in and day out, day in and day out. So that's where you see accumulation over time. Um, so the reality is that, you know, all of that 
the specific fragrances, that's a whole other issue because oh. the word fragrance, um, no one needs to disclose what's in there. You know, what is fragrance? What is that fake fragrance? You know, that pine smell doesn't come from a real, you know, pine cone or that lemon isn't coming from a lemon in most of these cleaning products. So that can be, you know, dozens of undisclosed chemicals, but we know that um, a lot of those chemicals are harmful. A lot of them are affecting our hormones. You know, by definition, almost 99% of the time, if you have a fragrance chemical, it requires phthalates, which we mentioned earlier. Those endocrine disrupting chemicals, they're, you know, linked to obesity, they're linked to infertility, they're linked to a whole host of things. And they actually also, what they do is that they bind the smell um, to the product, right? So they're usually in there too. Um, so the good news is that you do not need to clean with chemicals. Um, because if you think about it, you know, if you're cleaning with a chemical, you're, there's a chemical residue that's not clean, right? You know, you don't yeah. have any kind of residue there that's clean. So you can literally clean with water and vinegar. You can literally clean with a non-toxic soap and water. And today, for those of you who don't want to do it on your own, um, there's countless cleaning products that are truly non-toxic that are on the market. You just have to know um, how do you source them out. But um, generally, a good start is a that they disclose they disclose the ingredients. You know, if you have a company that's not disclosing their ingredients, that's already like an alert. Um, yeah. And, and there's good databases. You know, you, we talked about EWG earlier. They have a great um, database, which is, again, not perfect, but it's such a good start and a, a good aid for anyone who's starting this journey. And it's you just Google EWG cleaners database and you can input the name of any cl cleaner and most of them are there. And you can also look for suggestions. Um, and obviously my webpage has tons of suggestions constantly. Um, but yeah, there's no need, you know, you do not have to clean with chemicals. And that's probably one of the, I don't know if it's the easiest places to start when you're, you know, switching things out because emotionally people have, have like an emotional connection to their cleaners, yes. but it's an important place to start, I'd say. For sure. Um, what about like one of the things that I found has been really hard to find a natural replacement for, and maybe you have a suggestion is Windex. Like Windex is one of those things that's like, interesting. Nothing this is not the first time I hear this, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you've already got an answer for me. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, there's, I have two options for you, right? There is the vinegar and water option and you can actually clean with, I don't do this, but I this I've heard, I haven't tried it yet. Um, if you spray with vinegar and water and you use newspaper to clean, which in my head would leave a residue of something, but- I heard this back in the day, like in the old days that that- I've heard of that. We personally just use, we'll use either water and vinegar or we'll use Branch Basics, which we like a lot, which is a good company that contains like non-toxic cleaners. Um, they sell non-toxic cleaners. But I think the key with glass is really to make sure you're thoroughly drying it. Um, so that means that you need to get either a good cloth or just good paper towel, or you can use a little squeegee thing, which helps a lot also, like in showers, for example. And um, and that's really the key. It's not so much the products, in my opinion. Um, you know, it's we haven't had- process. What? It's the process more than the product. It's more the process. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to put a little bit of um, arm strength in there, a little bit of, <laughs> but it okay. works. Um, it does work, and again, no need to use Windex, really. You just don't. Okay. Okay. Well, those have been amazing tips. Thank you so much. <laughs> Where can people find you? Um, well, I am. I have my website, which is threelittleplums.com. And I'm very active on Instagram, which is at threelittleplums. Um, and if you sign up for the newsletter, I always send extra tips. If you're not into, you know, if you're not into Instagram, <laughs> you can get information via there. Um, and I have a couple of guides available to help make this whole low tox living thing much easier, stress-free as possible. Thank you so much, Aida. It's been so fun chatting with you guys. We'll include all the links and um, so you can find Aida. And if you guys have any more questions, feel free to reach out. Reach out. 
but it has been such a lovely conversation and I thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Until next time.